thank you dr rashmin and thank you aws for uh, giving me the opportunity i'll slightly modify the topic to optic genetics in 2022 current understanding because most of the new things have become standard practice most of the places uh, so i'll be trying to cover uh, into the following headings what are the current insights into the etiology what is the current recommended workup guidelines for treatment a little bit about pediatric optic neuritis and covid-19 and optic neuritis well we all know that optic neuritis is primarily secondary to demyelination and it could be either as an isolated disease or a clinically isolated syndrome but more often than not there is a some associated cns disease the most common four etiologies being multiple sclerosis acute disseminated encephalomyelitis neuromyelitis optica and mog associated demyelinating disorder in india we should never forget the para infectious and post vaccination demyelinations that are quite common so what is the current literature that tells us about the etiology so this is a western study coming from the rochester group where they looked in the uh, population based incidence of uh, patients seen in a single center between 2010 to 2018 and they found that the annual incidence was about 4 per 100000 majority of the patients had multiple sclerosis as the final etiology but about one third was idiopathic and fortunately nmo and mog accounted for only 9% of all cases but it is still not less one out of 10 cases because they can be associated with recurrences and some optimal visual outcomes similar literature coming in pediatric age group from the pd group showed that final six month diagnosis was a one of the fine neuro inflammatory syndromes in nearly one out of two patients 50% of patients and most common was mog followed by adem and then multiple sclerosis if you see here nmo is slightly more than the reported incidence in the west uh, adults what about indian data so there is a very good study that has come up this year from sm group and they screen 203 patients of optic neuritis between 2018 and 2019 they were worked up with neuroimaging and serological testing and what was found was that uh, mog was the most common disease final etiology followed by multiple sclerosis in one out of 10 and nmo was about 5% what was very important message was that despite extensive work up nearly one uh, one half were double zero negative for nmo mog and did not have ms also uh, the poor uh, these uh, the study also showed that there was female preponderance in ms and nmo but not in mog what why it is important for us to distinguish between the final underlying etiology it is so because the chances of recurrence are different in each disease as well as the amount of damage that can happen and the progressive neurological disability that can happen is different with ms and nmo so do we have some clinical clues so this is a study from a uk group uh, by hackohen and colleagues where they looked at the differences between different diseases in recurrent cases and the message that was coming was that patients with ms versus non ms tended more often tended to be female they were adolescent and young adults and never presented with adam like picture they were more often to present with a brain stem clinically isolated syndrome than any other type of the demyelinating disease we know with mog optic neuritis there are certain features which go clinically to tell us that this could be mog associated optic neuritis for example hemorrhages around the optic disc which are otherwise atypical feature for ms associated cns dysfunction presentation with seizures confusion confabulations area post tumor syndrome prolonged hiccups vomitings and they do tend to have recurrences with good outcomes and even on mri we can see larger lesions in patients with mog optic neuritis like adam like picture the study also showed some differences between nmo versus mog and the patients with mog associated optic neuritis were younger around 6 years of age in children and presented with monophasic disseminated encephalomyelitis whereas patients with nmo st presented more often with transverse myelitis and more often with area post tumor syndrome as compared to patients with mog associated optic neuritis so given this what should be our recommended workup in today's age well we need to do the ocular investigations to document visual functions visual fields which are very important we need to document structural damage oct rnfl and mgcl which was very well elaborated but you may skip it at the presentation you can do it around 3 to 4 weeks when the changes will start manifesting and if you have diagnostic dilemmas then we can go to vep and oct angiography
but what is very important what is a systemic workup you need to get a neuroimaging ideally serology and csf analysis for all but do we have some clues do we skip this a bit so uh, we'll come to it through this slide the most important investigation i think all of us obtain is a mri the most important thing over here is to understand how the mri can give us clues to the underlying etiology so if we see this adapted figure from this landmark article by Dutra and et al, we can see that in MS, the optic nerves tends to be involving one eye at a time usually. It tends to be smaller lesion involving less than one third of the optic nerve. The MRI of the spine can show presence of interlateral columns, white matter lesions. They tend to be smaller lesions. They are not contiguous big lesions. And what is characteristic is the presence of multiple brain lesions. You can see periventricular lesions, you can see subcortical, juxtacortical, and even in the brainstem. As compared to this, NMO associated optic neuritis will usually have bilateral optic neuritis, can be long segments, can involve the chiasm and the free chiasmatic optic nerve. The spinal cord lesions, they are big, involving more than three segments, three contiguous segments of the spinal cord, located mainly in the, in the dorsal spine, and the lumbar spine and the brain matter brain lesions are usually in the periapendimal areas in mog there can be bilateral optic neuritis but involvement of chiasm and pre chiasmatic optic nerve is rare lesions can be long in optic nerve similar to nmo we can have letm lesions or long transverse myelitis lesions but involve the sacrococcygeal area more often and we can have big adam like lesions in the brain but they can be involving the area postema as well so if you keep this picture in mind, you have some clue and then you can definitely get the serological workup uh, based on this. This is similar uh, observations made in the uh, landmark article from SN this year. And what I was showing before, the NMO can have periapendimal lesions. These can be very important when your serological workup for NMO and MOG is negative, but these lesions can give us the clues to the diagnosis. So to say MRI is a must, it will rule out other structural lesions, but we should image MRI brain and orbits with contrast. And MRI spine can be very useful, ideally many centers recommend doing it early, but definitely if you have recurrent disease or you have very strong suspicion for MS. I'll skip OCT because it's very well covered, but I would just like to say that the, the loss will be evident after a few weeks and you can do it at that time. And there, the amount of loss that happens with NMO and MS is much, uh, NMO and MOG is much more as compared to MS. A very small uh, word about OCT NGO. We can see that both can, uh, patients can have extremes of presentation, like a 40 year old person presenting can be NMO and can be MOG associated optic neuritis, and they can have hemorrhages with both. So, given that OCT NGO can be given uh, some clues, we can see the capillary perfusion dropouts in NIO. So it can help in diagnosis. So coming to briefly to treatment, most principles of ONTT apply, but the acute phase management <coughs> is towards five days of IVMP, followed by second line treatment with plasma pheresis if you are not getting good response. And chronic phase, we need to give specific immunomodulators. It is very important to give for MS and NMO because the chances of progressive neurological disability is much higher but in MOG, fortunately, the 70% of patients do not have recurrence, do not have progressive disability, so you can do it only for the recurrent cases in MOG. There are many treatment options. Plasma pheresis and IVIG are becoming standard of care for poor recovery optic neuritis and NMO. And other monoclonal antibodies, it's beyond uh, the scope of time to go into that, but they are becoming mainstay in NMO ST management. Very last slide telling about COVID, there is significant amount of reported literature uh, which tells that COVID can have a prodromal association, can have a temporal association presenting with demyelination. And if you see the literature, it can be either any of these. Patient can have recurrence in previously known case or de novo. So we need to do a workup to rule out COVID associated optic neuritis and take it, uh, take a relevant history. So with this, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Any, maybe a, one comment from the chair and one from the expert. Maybe Dr. Ambika would like to say. Very nice talk, Dr. Virender. And uh, probably I think you have to add for the optic neuritis blood workup also in all yeah. these cases.
because it should not be a over diagnosis of a demyelinating spectrum disorder and we do deal with non demyelinating group of disorders also in this bracket and if you're going to deal with a patient who is in the 40s and earlier before the onset of mox spectrum disorders there would have been over diagnosis of an ischemic neuropathy treatment options so watch for them also and I would like to know what's your experience in uh, a recurrent and poor visual optic neuritis and what is the first line of drug you choose? You plex them? Yeah, uh, we are tending to, when there's poor recovery optic neuritis, whether NMO or double zero negative, we are going towards plasmapheresis followed by IVIG. Okay, because sometimes when we have these zero negative disorders, uh, better if the neurologist is giving a choice of interferons, just be careful because this is going to worsen the yeah. spectrum of a NMO, NMO versus than a MOG. If at all it turns out to be a MOG in the future and watch for what testing tool they are using for these zero markers sure. because the sensitivity and specificity can also be down. Very well taken point. Thank you. I have Dr. Swati. Uh, any other point from any other expert? Yes, ma'am. Is there any role of plasmapheresis in double zero negative patients of optic neuritis? Uh, yes. Plasmapheresis is supposed to remove the antibodies. But when the patient is double zero negative. I think Dr. Ambika just alluded that to that the sensitivity of the test is very low. So if the, it could be false negative. So we don't know. So we, if you are able to remove the load of antibodies, the patient's uh, prognosis visual outcome might be better. Uh, maybe I, uh, I would prefer a rituximab in that version. If the rituximab doesn't respond, probably rit uh, Plex will be the later option unless the patient is having a neurological manifestations. Uh, we're in, the, in COVID-19, uh, do you see both MOG as well as ecoporin positive in some of the situation? We have uh, seen uh, 12 patients where we could allude to COVID-19 and only NMO was positive in only one. Rest all were zero, zero negative for everything. Okay, thank you. Rest work covered there. Because in our plasma pharesis is done by other department, not by. So when you refer them, they say when there are no antibody, what you are going to gain it. So that's how I'm asking. So yeah. I think the, the other thought is maybe there are antibodies which we are not able to detect right now. I mean, Prof, I know that every day now they are detecting.